Lakshmi welcoming you to this special World Kindness Day live cast on the kindness and mental, emotional, and spiritual connection. Now, we're all born with kindness, but how many of us make an intentional effort to put others ahead of ourselves? Now, to commemorate this World Kindness Day, we wanted to share inspiring stories through this session and also share some scientific evidence on the goodness of kindness and encourage everyone to be a little bit more kinder. After all, the world could use a little bit more kindness, right? Especially terrible year that we've all had. And, and to that, we have here none other, none other than the kindness doctor, Dr. James Doty. Now he is a founder and director of the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education at Stanford University, of which His Holiness, the Dalai Lama is a founding benefactor. He works with a variety of scientists from a number of disciplines examining the neural basis for compassion and altruism. Dr. Doty is an inventor, entrepreneur, and philanthropist. Now, Dr. Doty is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Into the Magic Shop, a neurosurgeon's quest to discover the mysteries of the brain and the secrets of the heart. That has now been translated into 40 languages. Dr. Doty's work has been cited in numerous media, including the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, NBC, ABC, and many others. Now, ever since I've read his book, I've been planning for this webinar for almost two years now. And finally, I'm delighted and privileged to be able to have this conversation with you uh, on this beautiful kindness day, Dr. Doty. So really a hearty welcome to you today. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you for having me. It's great to be with you uh, and also to be with you on uh, the World Kindness Day. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure. And uh, so there's so many questions in my mind. But first, I'm going to start off with your journey. Uh, just rewinding your life to the point when, you know, you were 12 years old, poor, with an alcoholic father and a mother chronically paralyzed by a stroke. Really, life must have been at a dead end for you. Now, from there to becoming a neurosurgeon. So what was that which, you know, influenced you? Now, I'd like to hear it from you. Sure. Well, uh, and I'm not uh, indicating that my life was the worst possible life, but certainly with an alcoholic father, a mother who had had a stroke, was partially paralyzed, chronically depressed, attempted suicide multiple times. We were on public assistance my entire life, and uh, we were evicted from various homes. But uh, when a child grows up in that type of an environment, of course, uh, they have a variety of emotions. Uh, one is a feeling that you're not worthy. You're filled with shame that somehow this is your fault. The other aspect is that, um, you have anger, uh, you have a sense of hopelessness and despair. You don't see yourself having a future. And, um, as a result, uh, this leads of course to unhappiness. What happened when I was 12 actually was that I um, actually I had left my house after an argument with my parents. And I would oftentimes when uh, these situations would occur, I would get on my bicycle and ride as far and as fast away from my house as I could. And in this particular instance, I ended up at a strip mall and in the mall was a magic shop. And I'd had an interest in magic and I decided to go in and what happened was that uh, there was a woman there at the counter, uh, probably in her mid fifties, who had long flowing uh, grayish hair. And she was had these glasses sitting on the tip of her nose with the chain around them. And she was reading this very thick paperback book, but she looked up and she had this radiant smile. And for somebody of my background, Oftentimes, we're used to being judged uh, because of our um, financial situation, our age, uh, a whole variety of factors. And the thing about this interaction was that I felt immediately that this woman was embracing 
was non-judgmental, actually cared, uh, was actually listening. And um, the first thing she explained to me was that she knew nothing about the magic in the store, that it was her son's store. He was running an errand and she essentially was watching the store. So, uh, which was all fine. Uh, so we began this conversation and I would tell you that what's really important for someone from a background like my own is uh, for someone to create an environment of psychological safety. Because when somebody feels safe, they're able to relax, they're able to tell the truth, they're not ashamed. And so we began this conversation and she asked me a series of questions, which I answered honestly, when oftentimes I would not. And um, at the end of our conversation, she said to me, I'm here for the next six weeks. And uh, if you come in every day, I think I can teach you something that could really help you. Now, I had no clue what she meant, what this involved. But the reality was, number one, um, I had absolutely nothing else to do. Uh, number two, she actually uh, was... Uh, giving me cookies during, during our conversation, which I appreciated. And um, so as a result, I showed up every day. And what happened is uh, something uh, that actually at that time was quite extraordinary. And it had two parts. One was this concept of uh, what is called mindfulness today. And the other was manifestation of your intention. And so the first thing she taught me, which I actually did not appreciate before, was that I was very tense. And the reality is, when you grow up in an environment that is chaotic, one in which you never know what's going to happen next, then you're always tense because you have engaged your sympathetic nervous system. And this, of course, is our flight, fight, or freeze mode. And uh, uh, so you have this whole changing of your physiology. You're releasing epinephrine, norepinephrine, these catecholamines. You're releasing an increase in cortisol and other stress hormones uh, because you're anticipating uh, the fight or flight mode. And when you're in that mode, you actually limit your choices because you're in survival mode. You don't have time to think through every possibility of what could happen you're looking for the quickest exit. Now, that may not be the smartest move. You could probably accomplish something from other uh, methods if you had access to them. Uh, so I was always in this mode. And when you're in that mode, you cannot be present and you cannot attend. Uh, so what happened was that uh, the first thing she taught me was a relaxation technique, which in modern day parlance, if you will, as a body survey. And so I was sitting, relaxed, but sitting uh, uh, with my back straight, looking at her. And then with intention, I went through this exercise, relaxing all the way beginning at my toes to the top of my head. In association with a breathing exercise she taught me, as well as focusing, actually in this case, on a candle. Now, to be bluntly honest with you, uh, as a kid that age with no experience doing this, I initially thought uh, this was a waste of my time, but I did it. And what I found over a few weeks was that I was now able to relax. I was now able to focus and attend. And the thing is to excel and perform, you have to be able to focus and attend. So once she taught me that, the other thing she focused on was the negative dialogue that I had going on in my head. And so many of us have a negative dialogue. And the reason is, is from an evolutionary point of view, negative things have a tendency to stick to us because it's the negative things that put us at risk in a hostile environment. But unfortunately, commentary uh, also sticks to us in a similar way. We don't sit there and process, boy, I'm really great. I'm really good at this. We sit there and go, gosh, I failed. I could have done better, et cetera, et cetera, which then translates into I'm not worthy. I'm not capable. I can't do this. I can't do this. Uh, 
And I didn't realize that. And uh, once you realize that, you also understand that being hypercritical of yourself then creates a narrative uh, which results in how you look at the world is impaired. You start looking at the world from these hypercritical uh, eyes. And so she taught me how to change that dialogue from one of negativity to one of positivity, one of self-affirmation, one of acceptance, uh, one where you feel you are worthy, where that it, you are capable of doing anything you wish to do. Because what happens is when you carry on this negative dialogue, it's as if you're placing brick by brick in the creation of a prison wall or cell. And the more you say it, the walls get higher and it becomes darker and darker. And so when she made me understand that that narrative was not truth, it then allowed me to look at the world through a different lens. And this is called self-compassion. And a lot of research has been done in this area by uh, Kristen Neff and uh, Chris Germer. And it has been scientifically demonstrated to have a huge impact by changing this view of yourself. And once I was able to do that, then I recognized that I was not the only person suffering, that in some ways everyone is suffering and that by focusing only on myself, in some ways it was not helpful and it was self-serving. Once I realized that others were suffering and can see the world through that lens, uh, and after uh, understanding the nature of self-compassion, it then allowed me to be compassionate to everyone, which of course translates on some level into kindness. As you probably know, kindness is simply doing a act for another human being that affects them hopefully in a positive way. It doesn't have any connection necessarily to suffering whatsoever. Compassion uh, is defined as recognizing the suffering of another with the motivational desire to alleviate that suffering. So that really changed my entire perspective. Also, what happens is that when you shift from this uh, uh, stress mode or this uh, engagement of your sympathetic nervous system, and you shift over to your parasympathetic nervous system, this is called the rest and digest system. When you're in that mode, many things physiologically happen. Your heart rate slows down, your blood pressure decreases, your immune system is boosted. The expression of inflammatory proteins is decreased the level of stress hormones is decreased in your blood. And ultimately, when you're, the more you're in this mode, this also stimulates your pleasure and reward centers and actually lengthens your telomeres, which are those genes that are associated with increase in longevity. So it has a very profound positive effect, but the most important effect is it gives you access to your prefrontal cortex and this part of your brain called your uh, executive control area. And that gives you access to experiences, uh, thoughts, memories of prior events that allow you to make much more thoughtful and discerning decisions, which obviously uh, is in contrast to engagement of the sympathetic nervous system, which is this limitation of possibilities to having a whole variety of possibilities. And when you're able to do that, you're able to much, make much more thoughtful, discerning decisions, which typically are much more positive. So uh, that is what happened in that experience in the magic shop. But the other thing that happened too was she also made me recognize that it was within my power that I had agency to manifest uh, what I wanted. And what I mean by that is that, and I'm sure you're familiar, athletes uh, uh, oftentimes are uh, taught to visualize uh, the performance that they want to have. They go th through in their memory, 
or in their mind exactly what's going to happen from the start of the, the race to the end of the race, every movement, et cetera, et cetera. And it turns out that that technique, which was really, uh, I think, begun in the 80s or maybe 90s, uh, actually is very apropos to manifesting anything you want. And so uh, she taught me a technique whereby I made a list of those things that were most important for me to accomplish, at least in my 12 year old mind, and then uh, had me write them down over and over again, had me read the list uh, uh, to myself, read it aloud, and then sit with each goal and visualize myself having it manifest. And that proved to be a very, very profound technique. It actually uh, allowed me to achieve everything on my list. Now, again, in a 12 year old mind, I had this confusion about what I thought I wanted. I wanted to live in a mansion. I wanted to drive a Porsche. I wanted to have a Rolex watch, which is very immature and uh, certainly not unusual though, uh, in a child's mind of thinking uh, what is important. But uh, ultimately, I realized through experience that uh, that puts you on the path to believing that acquiring things or certain achievements is going to make you happy. And clearly, as we all know, both perhaps from our own experience and experience of others, that does not make you happy. But that did allow me to, the technique she taught me, believe that I could go to college, to medical school, become a neurosurgeon ultimately, become an entrepreneur. Uh, so that had a very positive benefit. But at the end of the day, uh, I had to face the fact that I was still unhappy. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Dutty. I mean, it's a beautiful story and you elaborated on a a lot of points, actually. I do have some questions in connection with that. Probably we can go a little bit more detail into those a little later. But your story personally was very inspiring for me. You know, two things which the takeaways that I had was that a simple act of kindness could turn someone's life completely, you know, forever, really. And also the fact that uh, you had said that one can design a brighter future than what you could actually imagine at the current time right so that was just absolutely amazing so i was going to ask have you have you ever gone back to that magic shop to see uh, this uh, kind lady again in your life well you have to remember uh i was 12 and she was probably 55 so she passed long ago but uh a couple of things uh, about nine months after uh i had this experience actually i decided to go back and thank her because my life had changed. And yeah. I rode my bicycle out to the strip mall and dusk was about to happen. And this was in the high desert. So, you know, the sky was sort of a dark blue with clouds. The wind was blowing. And I got to the, shop, the strip mall and it was surrounded by a fence and all the shops had closed. It was vacant. Nobody was there. And as I'm looking at this and trying to figure out whether I actually honestly dreamed this and it didn't exist, this big tumbleweed hit me and my bike, I was on my bike and I just stood there and it was surreal, right? Uh, I mean, yeah. uh, did this happen? Did it not happen? Am I imagining things? Am I crazy? Uh, when I decided to write the book, though, interestingly enough, I uh, hired an investigator and who went back and sorted through all of this. And it turned out, in fact, there was uh, a magic shop called the Magic Rabbit. The owner's mother, her name was, in fact, Ruth. And that uh, it closed, again, uh, a few months before I went back there. Mm -hmm. And uh, in further investigating the situation, it turned out that she died of breast cancer about seven years after my experience with her. More um, information perhaps is that it turned out that the owner of the store had been married, uh, was divorced. His wife and son who was 10 lived a distance away and that the mother uh, Ruth had actually come there 
to spend time with her grandson. And uh, unfortunately, the parents got to an argument and the mother refused to send the child. And I think that in some ways, I was the substitute uh, for her grandson, of which, of course, uh, I'm very appreciative because it changed the uh, trajectory of my life. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Doty. Also, I, I mean, you, we have to understand, and I see that as a 12-year-old boy, I mean, your soul must have been so ready. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure when, uh, how a 12-year-old boy could understand all these things, the value of all that's been shared uh, at that time to you. So your soul must have been very ready. Uh, to receive these things. And, you know, we are happy to, uh, you know, have Dr. Dodi with us today. So thanks to that kind lady out there uh, who had, uh, you know, uh, initiated these things in some way in you. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's interesting you say that, you know, oftentimes we hear the statement, uh, the teacher appears when the student's ready. Uh, but I, I would have to tell you that I had uh, no self-awareness. And uh, that, again, I told you the reasons why I showed up. It wasn't because I was going, oh, my gosh, this woman is going to teach me all these incredible insights, et cetera, et cetera. But um, what I do know is that the teachings were deeply profound and did change my life. And also, even at that age, made me appreciate that others suffered. and. Um, made me appreciate the power of kindness and compassion. And that uh, certainly stayed with me. But as I told you, I was fairly immature at 12 when I made this list. And I began this uh, quest, if you will, to accomplish these different tasks. Uh, but at every task I accomplished, um, I was not any more happy. And it was as if, okay, if I do, if I go to medical school, I'm going to be happy. Okay. If I uh, become a neurosurgeon, I'm going to be happy. If I become a professor at Stanford, I'm going to be happy. If I make a, a several million dollars, I'm going to be happy. And at every stage, I was not happy. And it really was only until uh, I had achieved all of these things. And then in the course of that, after becoming very wealthy from investments and things, uh, was during the dot-com uh, crash. And over that period of time, which was about six weeks, I ended up losing about $78 million and actually ended up being about $3 million in debt. Wow. And of course, uh, that does get your attention. And, uh, uh, and I also found that uh, in a situation like that, you get two good friends. One is your banker and one is your lawyer. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, this whole thing put me through a, a period of deep reflection, which actually took me back to what Ruth had taught me. And I was able to separate out the technique that she taught me to manifest from my immaturity as a 12 year old as to what I wanted to achieve. And then, uh, I realized that while I was never a bad person in any way, uh, I was always outwardly focused to accomplish something to fill the void that I had or the shame or sense of inferiority that I had. And once I reflected on that, uh, I decided to reorient my life uh, from not necessarily from bad to good, but from outwardly trying to achieve to assuage my own shame or insecurities, but to be self-focused in the sense that I was focused on being of service to others. And when you're able to do that, that in fact really changes everything. Uh, so what ultimately happened while I was $3 million in the hole, had to sell my penthouse in San Francisco, my Ferraris, my Porsches, uh, all the things that I thought were important. I also got divorced uh, in the process of going up the ladder, if you will. Uh, 
I decided to change my perspective. And during this time in the uh, conversations with my attorneys trying to figure out what I was going to do, I had ended up making a significant donation of stock from a company that I had run to charity. And in these meetings with the attorneys, it turned out that they had actually not processed the request that I had made. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I could take all of that stock back. And uh, which, of course, if you're $3 million in the hole is very appealing. But I did not do that. What I decided to do was to go ahead and still give it to charity. And that amount of money when the company went public was $30 million. So I wow. set up health clinics uh, around the world, uh, funded blood banks, um, programs for the disabled, programs for children and adolescents with AIDS, HIV, uh, endowed scholarships at multiple universities, funded research at universities. And by doing that, I realized um, how being of service positively affects you. And looking through the lens of that, uh, if you will, being compassionate, being kind, uh, that changed my entire life. It allowed me to um, create the center at Stanford, of which the Dalai Lama became the founding benefactor. It allowed me to do research validating the value proposition of kindness, compassion, empathy, and altruism. Uh, it actually ultimately stimulated me to write this book. And, uh, and that book, uh, of course, as you mentioned, is all around the world. It's been a bestseller in multiple countries and frankly has profoundly affected so many people's lives um, in a positive way because it made them appreciate one, what's truly important and not what you think is important. And two, how being kind and compassionate actually changes your life. Because there's this mythology of something called the uh, realm of the hungry ghost. And it's this narrative that says that you have this uh, insatiable appetite. And what happens is many people feel that accomplishment, making money, showing off, having things, is going to feed that hunger. And they keep trying to stuff this down their throat. And uh, essentially, it's empty calories. And only when you're of service to others uh, is your uh, appetite satiated. And that was a very, very profound lesson. And it has actually been demonstrated to me the power of it personally, but also on some level, a great sadness about how so many people in society are very self-absorbed and feel that chasing after wealth is what gives them happiness and fulfillment. And sadly, so often, especially among poor people or even middle-class people, they believe that having wealth is going to solve all their problems. If I just have this, you know, my family will love me. If I just have this, I'll have a girlfriend. If I just do this, life is going to be better for me. And the problem is those external accomplishments are completely meaningless if your motivation is to impress others. Uh, and so uh, that entire perspective change, uh, at least for me, was extraordinarily powerful. And frankly, for many of the people I've interacted with uh, through my book have actually uh, learn to understand that while there's nothing wrong with making yourself comfortable, living well, taking care of your family, if your sole motivation is money or conspicuous consumption, you're going to be very unhappy. Versus if you focus your life on being of service for caring for others, frankly, going out of your way to help others, not only is that more internally fulfilling, but what happens is you realize then that all these other things you thought you wanted actually oftentimes are a consequence of you actually being kind and generous. It's a, definitely an extraordinarily profound uh, sharing 
uh, and your personal experience that you shared with us uh, today, Dr. Dote. I, I see your point and certainly success and money cannot buy love and happiness. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, thank you again for that. Now, the next question was, you know, through sea care, you know, you must have overseen a number of researchers, you know, development of a variety, and you had developed a variety of uh, apps and programs to address issues of stress and anxiety and burnout through a lens of kindness and compassion. Could you share with us any conclusive evidence or research showing the value of kindness and compassion with us? Sure. Uh, you know, there are a variety of studies that I have done and other people have, do, have done that demonstrate a couple things. One is that through a mindfulness or meditation practice, you can decrease your own stress and anxiety. Uh, again, not from striving to get things or this issue of attachment and craving, uh, but one, acceptance of reality, and two, by, um, again, as I mentioned, being of service, because it changes your physiology in a very positive way. So uh, as an example, we've created a compassion cultivation training program, of which multiple studies have been done, which validate uh, this practice, actually, will, which is a form of a mindfulness practice that has been combined with a technique for self-compassion and compassion for others. And so it's very, very powerful in allowing you to accept positive affirmations from others, because oftentimes when you're hypercritical of yourself and somebody compliments you, you can't even take the compliment. Uh, it allows you to understand your self-worth and accept your self-worth without denigrating that fact. It also uh, creates a sense of calmness through acceptance and removal of your attachment or craving, which of course, uh, then you're relaxed, you're not anxious about things. And what we do know is that when you are able to connect with another versus not being present and thinking about what could have been, might have been, or should have been, or focusing on a future which hasn't occurred, that allows you to be present and actually listen and connect. And of course, one of the most powerful agents, if you will, to improve your health and longevity is social connection and deep, strong relationships. A lot of people talk about the blue zones, which I'm sure you're aware of these places in the world where people routinely live to be over 100. And it's funny because there are probably a million uh, uh, cookbooks on the Mediterranean diet, which is wonderful. And diet is important, as is, you know, uh, alcohol in moderation, exercise in moderation, etc. But by far, far and away, the greatest contributor to one's longevity and health is deep social connection. And in yeah. fact, uh, a study was done at Harvard that has lasted over 80 years obviously multiple investigators, but it's followed these undergraduates, uh, uh, and in this case males, because that's the way it was 80 years ago, but regardless, it followed these men over the span of their entire lifetimes. And again, it showed that the healthiest, the most uh, long living were those individuals who had uh, social connection and deep relationships, because that is what supports you, this feeling that you're accepted no matter what that, uh, look, all of us make mistakes, all of us have failures, but what's important is that someone loves you, cares about you, and accepts you. And uh, that is uh, the primary determinant of a healthy, long life. Brilliant. Now, how do you make this kindness a habit, you know, as a matter of routine to oneself, to others? Uh, to nature. Any suggestions for some lifestyle techniques that would help us become kinder, more sure. altruistic people? Well, uh, you know, it's interesting because what happens to a lot of people is that they get distracted in their own life. 
and they get distracted by focusing on their self and what they want to accomplish. And of course, this leads to all the negative aspects. Uh, so uh, what I would suggest uh, uh, is that you begin every day with this motivation. And my own practice is uh, that I wake up and I sit on the side of my bed. I go mm -hmm. through a breathing practice because that shifts me again over to engagement of the parasympathetic nervous system. Then I think of the joy and awe of being in this world, but without attachment uh, to anything related to that. Uh, you know, I always tell people uh, I'm happy simply by waking up in the morning. Uh, and therefore, you don't need anything <laughs> beyond that. And mm -hmm. then what I go through is what I mentioned in my book is this alphabet of the heart. Okay. And so I sit on the side of the bed and I start with C. It's 10 letters, C through L. And I sit there with my eyes closed, breathing. And I think about uh, compassion for self and others recognizing the dignity of every person, uh, this idea of equanimity or evenness of temperament, not getting distracted through uh, either the stresses of things not going as you wanted or chasing uh, accomplishments which don't bring happiness oftentimes. And then practicing forgiveness because you know when you carry this anger and hostility, all it does is affect your own physiology in a negative way and distracts you from being present. Uh, some people say it's like drinking poison and somehow expecting it to affect the other person. And it's not to say uh, you forget about this uh, injustice, if you will, but you're not attached to it anymore. You don't carry the anger about it. Of course, the other, which has been a very much demonstrated to be very powerful, is this concept of having gratitude. You know, so many accomplished people, or even others uh, who are just uh, uh, having challenges, so often we look up at what others have and not be appreciative of what we have. And again, in some ways, this is a form of craving. You want what they have, again, under the false notion that uh, you believe that if you have that, all your problems will be solved. You know, it's interesting, there are innumerable examples of, as an example of people winning the lottery. And of course, they go and they, you know, they bought tickets, you know, once a week or whatever. They go, God, if I get this, I'm going to be happy. All my problems are going to be solved. And, you know, 99% of them uh, go through this money in less than a year. Uh, they've actually found that it brings out oftentimes the most negative in those around them. And then they no longer have it and their life or their level of happiness didn't change one iota. And, and this is this belief that there's some external determinant of you being happy. Uh, next is humility. Uh, you know, I recognize as an example in my job as a neurosurgeon that while nominally I'm in charge as the uh, surgeon, but I could not do my job without so many other people, uh, the nurses, the people who clean the bedpans, the people who sweep the floors. There is nothing that I do of which I do it alone. And when you recognize all the individuals who are helping you move forward in this world, who are helping you um, actually care, uh, it's really quite amazing. And when you acknowledge that, when you accept that, uh, I think that is a very powerful thing because you realize you are no important, more important than anyone else in this world. And, you know, we see people who are arrogant or egotistical go around and they pound their chest and say how great they are. And they aren't great. The greatest person in the world is a person who quietly sits, who understands his place, who does his job with great integrity and intention, and who is satisfied. Uh, I is for integrity or values that you that bound your behavior in this world. 
J is justice or a sense of fairness towards others. You know, based on our positions in society, I believe that we have a responsibility to care for those who are vulnerable. The other, right. is, uh, the other is K, uh, which as we've talked about is kindness. And all of this is contained by love. And so I go through that every morning and it sets my intention for the day. It deals with uh, my own ego and it creates a sense of calmness. And then uh, as I go through my day, if something occurs or I get particularly anxious or, or uh, tense, I just step back for a minute or two or three and either pick a letter or an experience associated with that letter or go through the entire uh, 10 letters and close my eyes and then it's all good again. Beautiful. Certainly it's the, it um, rekindles that innate uh, self-kindness. Now, it definitely sounds great, but however, in reality, we have a lot of challenges from the brain. Our brain is trained, uh, you know, according to what we receive, experience and learn from our environment. For example, when we are hurt by somebody, we just start to fear people and, you know, we start to hate them. Now, fear of the known, and then there's also fear of the unknown as well. Oh, what do you think can help overcome this? Uh, what do you think of meditation? Do you think that facilitates a releasing fear in some way? Well, uh, of course. I mean, I think if you are trained correctly, it can be an extraordinarily powerful tool for many people. One is it uh, uh, leads to calmness. It, of course, positively affects your physiology. It makes you understand um, who you are and orients you towards appropriate values that actually improve your physiology, as we talked about kindness, uh, compassion. And it creates a narrative um, for you to lead your life. And what happens is, uh, you realize the kinder you are, the more compassionate you are, the more thoughtful you uh, are of others, that um, you're happier and your physiology works better. And um, nothing is more powerful, um, frankly, uh, for your own happiness than just simply being kind to others. You know what people forget is that Oftentimes, these types of acts uh, are simply saying hello to somebody. That's right. Or right. going out of your way to help another person. Or as an example, I was in Denver recently, and there was a homeless person. And I just walked over, we started talking. Uh, I ended up buying him dinner, we sat and talked for about an hour. And, uh, and it, it was incredible. I mean, not that I'm doing this to feel good, but this type of an act to just reach out to someone and actually even listen and hear their story, I think is very, very powerful. Right. You know, it, it was interesting. It's, I was with the, go ahead. Sorry, I was saying these days we spend too much time on our phones. So uh, giving time for others is something very valuable, what you're sharing. Uh, no, and I think all of us have that uh, ability. And in fact, I would suggest you stay away from your phone. You stay away from Facebook or Instagram uh, because they have a tendency to trap you in the narrative that you're not good enough uh, and uh, also emphasize the negative, as an example, for Facebook, not because they care about you. They're only interested in increasing their profits. But what they do do is they enlist the help of neuroscientists, psychologists to create narratives that result in the release of dopamine, which of course, <coughs> excuse me, stimulates your reward and pleasure centers and makes you want to go back. It's highly addictive. Mm -hmm. And then sadly, uh, it creates also a narrative of perfectionism. And, uh, you know, they have all these filters and other techniques to make you look perfect when the fact of the matter is none of us are perfect. Uh, 
we're frail, fragile human beings. We all don't have the perfect bodies or the perfect teeth or blue eyes or whatever it is you're creating uh, that you think um, uh, makes you better than somebody. And it's hilarious uh, and sad when you see sort of these people unmasked, right? And I'm sure you've yeah. seen those photographs where you see this photograph of this absolutely beautiful woman uh, or man, and they look like perfect, their body's perfect, no blemishes, perfect everything. And then it shows them without any makeup on, no filters. And frankly, they just look like you or I, right? That's and, it. <laughs> and that's who we are. We don't have to be perfect in any way. In fact, uh, I'm sure you've met people who, frankly, uh, not that they don't care uh, about how they look, they just recognize it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, I have a 17-year-old son, and children, of course, go through these things where, uh, you know, they want to look particularly good. And, uh, you know, <laughs> he and I'll go out, and I'll be wearing sweats and a T-shirt and uh, flip-flops or something. He'll go, Dad, you're not dressed this way. We're going here. And I go, it's irrelevant how I'm dressed. And the fact of the matter is, if somebody shows up dressed like that and you're confident, it does nothing matters. You know, That's and right. these, the are, these are yes, these are the people yeah. you want to be around. Not right. these people who have to go into the store with a perfect suit and a tie and skinny. And uh, <laughs> uh, because again, frankly, you can usually see through that and you can see that they're striving to be something, not being who they are. That's right. Do you think, uh, Dr. Doty, that, uh, you know, it is somewhat connected with fear, fear of uh, the, the society may not accept us or the friends or a social circle will not accept us if we don't look or act a certain way, right? So being uh, self-compassionate towards oneself, do you think that will help us be more authentic and more genuine? Well, of course, uh, because, you know, this is the biggest fear of people is this fear of being judged by others. And as a result, it for many people, it causes a great deal of suffering. And sadly, of course, there are trolls or bullies in the world who, because of their own fears and anxieties or sense of failure, that they want to pull everyone else da down. Uh, but oftentimes, that can only occur if you let them. Yeah. Now, I'm not talking about violence or things like this, but I'm talking about people who make comments or try to uh, turn people against other people. You know, these are little people who are insecure and frankly, who have been hurt themselves. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it that way, <coughs> it sort of changes your own perception and actually, um, and hopefully uh, will allow you to be compassionate to them. But again, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, it's always interesting because you'll see a person who is confident in themselves in these types of situations. And actually, generally, people don't bully them. It's the people who are insecure, which That's is right. sensed by this other, these other people who then choose to take advantage of them, which only increases their insecurity and reinforces this narrative. Now, it's interesting because uh, I'm at times put in these uh, particular situations where I am me, I'm not trying to be anything else. Uh, but there are people who, you know, go off into this puffery of saying how important and how great they are. And in those situations, yeah, I will at times sort of use the things that are in my bot back pocket in terms of an accomplishment to just say, you know, you're not that important. But then again, neither am I, you know, these people who have to, and, and this is a narrative of how modern society works. These people, they're not vulnerable or authentic and they're terrified of being judged. So instead of saying, like, if somebody asks you, how are you doing? You go, you know, it's really bad. You know, my mother's sick, you know, uh, I'm going through a divorce. I'm really suffering at the moment. They'll sit there and go, everything's fine. Right, right. Mm. And it's not fine. 
And being vulnerable uh, and, and sort of sharing that, uh, my own experience has been, generally speaking, people embrace you and want to help versus That's sitting true. there saying, well, you know, I'm a doctor and I've done this and I wrote this book and I ran this company and I'm really important. That is completely meaningless. The most important thing is vulnerability and authenticity. You know, it's funny, I often give lectures and frankly, I tell stories about myself or other stories where my uh, voice will crack or I'll shed a tear. Mm -hmm. And what does that do? It allows everyone in the audience who've been holding this in to be vulnerable. And almost always they start crying with me. Right? That's right. Uh, but it's funny. I was at one, uh, I was giving one lecture and a woman came up to me afterwards and she said, gosh, I saw you up on the stage and I felt so sorry for you. You know, you must have been so embarrassed. I, your voice broke, a tear was coming out. You know, all these people looking at you and judging you. Gosh, that must have been so horrible. And I'm like really looking at this lady incredulously. And she goes on and says, I'm a psychiatrist and a hypnotherapist. If you show up uh, to me for three sessions, I can get rid of all of that. Now, why would you possibly want to get rid of this ability to stand up in front of people and be who you are, unfiltered, right. and showing your own vulnerability. Because yes. in some ways, you being vulnerable, you being able to stand up in front of a group of people is not a sign in any way of weakness. It's a sign of profound strength. And it allows so, people. Yeah. Yes, I think so, Joe. What you're sharing is absolutely very close to my heart. So I think people who are very uh, grounded and rooted and believe in their core values uh, really people like you who are more authentic and genuine and share their vulnerability. And that's where I think from there comes true humanness and connection with uh, others. So uh, it's, it's beautiful, actually. And finally, Dr. Lodi, I know we always run short of time and I'd love to have an endless conversation with you. But uh, this is something that I really wanted to ask you. You know, you're a successful doctor in life, economically, socially, professionally also. Now, if you could choose at this point of time to be either kind or success, being successful, which would you choose, you know, and why? Well, first of all, um, to me, being kind and compassionate is successful. You know, the success you're talking about, I'm assuming, relates to external appearances of success, living in a big house, driving a, a nice car, et cetera. Uh, I'm not interested in that in the sense that I neither define my life by that or am uh, motivated to make that the most uh, important thing at the top of my list. My repeated experience is that if I remain authentic, remain vulnerable, remain kind, remain compassionate, I will get everything I need, uh, which would define a full life. You know, I always tell people at the end of my days, uh, I will know that I have been successful when my children think of kindness, <clears throat> compassion, love, they think of me. Beautiful. Absolutely wonderful. And I think uh, that's a great message uh, you share for our audience today. Um, and for those of you listening in, I'd like to, uh, you know, pose the same question to you all. You know, if you were to choose between kindness and success, what would you choose and why? And we'd love to have some interactions from you all. So please feel free to think about it and uh, type your answers in the uh, chat box. And uh, Dr. Doty, it was really a great heartfelt conversation with you. And uh, I'd like to use this time to share this technique of heartfulness. You know, we talked about fear um, and you know, how to overcome it. So I just want to give our audience an experiential session uh, on this heartfulness technique, which is called cleaning or rejuvenation. So rather than you know putting it in words, I'd love you to all, all of you all to experience this at this moment. So please join us. It'll take about five minutes or so. 
Uh, so sit comfortably and close your eyes. Feel relaxed now. You are mentally cleaning complexities and impurities from your system. Think that they are leaving you. Settle down with the thought that all complexities and impurities are going away. Think that they are going out of your whole system, through your back, from the top of your head to your tailbone. Mentally suggest that the impurities and complexities are going out of your system from your back in the form of smoke or vapor. It is an active yet gentle process. Do not dwell on the specifics, specific events or things you want to get rid of. Simply brush them off. Gently accelerate the cleaning with confidence and faith and apply your will as needed. If your attention drifts and you find yourself involved in other thoughts, Gently bring your attention back to the cleaning process. Apply your will as needed. As the impressions are leaving from the back, you will start to feel lightness in your heart. Let's do this for a couple more minutes. When the complexities are gone, you feel simpler and lighter.
when the impurities have gone, you feel purer. Your whole body, every cell of your body is filled with lightness. Your heart is filled with lightness. Now with this thought, you may gently open your eyes when you feel ready. So thank you all. It's very important to be positive. And we know that we cannot be positive with a fearful mindset. And with conviction, I can say that this practice is a great tool for that. There's variations of this to detox fear, breathing exercises, as uh, Dr. Doty had shared earlier on you know, ways to seed positive thoughts and some techniques to build courage and confidence. And some of it, Dr. Dodi had, had shared earlier on with us as well. So really it's a holistic process. And by making it a part of our daily life, it will help us to let go of the habitual patterns and fear within us. So to know more about heartfulness cleaning or rejuvenation process, you may kindly reach out to us at pearl at heartfulness.org. Now, I'm kind of sad to say that this session is coming to an end, uh, but really I feel fulfilling in a way too, Dr. Doty, because through this session, you know, I'm sure that we have spread positivity, you know, through your stories, inspiring stories, heartfelt sharing, you know, we've made an impact, uplifted someone's heart out there. So, uh, any closing thoughts, Dr. Dote, from you? Well, of course, one is uh, be kind to yourself because that allows you, of course, to be kind and compassionate to others. And don't ever forget that each of us has the ability to improve the life of at least one other person every day. And sometimes that's just with a smile. Beautiful. In a, in a world where you can be anything, be kind, isn't it? It's uh, exactly beautiful, beautiful what you're saying. And some of my takeaways were, you know, some things really can't be bought, like love and happiness and kindness. You know, we may have everything in life. We talked about, you know, really meaning, you know, money, fame, success, and not love and happiness. So let's be wise, choose kindness, and we will surely find love and happiness like Dr. Doty did. And I'm very thankful to you for all the heartfelt sharings, the conversations we had. And uh, I hope after watching this session, we all as audience will also pledge to pass the compassion on. A little bit really goes a long way. So we look forward to seeing you all in our next session. Until then, take care. Bye for now. Thank Take you. Care. See you.